Hello, and welcome to Introducing Me. I'm your host, Sarah. I started this podcast to get to know other people and lifestyles while discovering more about myself. Each episode, I will give a new guest a chance to discuss their background, culture, interests, or whatever they want to talk about to help increase all of our own worldviews. Today, I would like to introduce you to Rabbi Noyo, who refers to herself as a, quote, radically inclusive rabbi. She identifies as a demi-woman who uses she-they pronouns. They use TikTok to spread awareness about the Jewish community, among other fun topics, and was recently hired as a university rabbi. So thank you, Rabbi Noyo, for being here so much. I'm excited for today. So why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself? Thank you for having me. My name is Rabbi Sarah Noyovitz, but everyone calls me Rabbi Noyo. It's uh, nice to have picked out my own nickname. <laughs> um, and I'm really excited. I've just moved to Syracuse. I'm the new campus rabbi for Syracuse University. I work in their Hillel, which is uh, the movement for Jewish community on college campuses in at least the United States. <laughs> it's a national movement. Um, and uh, it's been a uh, a really fun time getting to know my my coworkers and my supervisor and hitting the ground running and planning for the students to arrive. So what sort of plans are you trying to make? Is this a new position? Like it's obviously new to you or are you coming into like a well-established Hillel program? It's pretty well established. Uh, I'm not the first rabbi to work at Syracuse University. Um, or in Syracuse Hillel. Um, I actually went to school with my predecessor. We got together for coffee this week <laughs> so he could give me some tips and advice about um, what his experience was like and the Syracuse area, things to do, um, which was great. And we hadn't seen each other since he graduated. Um, the uh, the first thing on the to do list is the Jewish high holidays, which are coming up really fast, very early this year. Rosh Hashanah starts like the week after students arrive, which is the Jewish New Year, um, and ten days after that is Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. And so I am hard at work spending most of my time, not all of it, but most of it. <laughs> preparing the services because I'll be leading the services with some student participation, but I will be the one spiritual leader for the services. Um, sometimes there will be more than one clergy person, depending on um, like if the synagogue or the Hillel or whatever Jewish organization that's leading services has a budget for um, more than one clergy person. I know that last year, my predecessor, uh, his spouse was about to have their second child. So, and, and she was due on Rosh Hashanah or like, or thereabouts. Um, and so they had, they did hire, uh, another student, uh, another, uh, rabbinical school student friend of ours to help out. And it's a good thing they did because <laughs> their kid was born between the holidays. So, um, he was definitely, uh, uh, my predecessor was not present for Yom Kippur services that year. Um, but I am i am not expecting, and I don't have a partner who is expecting, so it's just me. Oh, that's great. So what sort of experience and how did you get yourself to where you are now taking over this position at Syracuse? It's kind of interesting to me to think about because when I started rabbinical school, which is a six-year program, some, some people finish it in uh, fewer years, depending on how much experience they had before, if they're transferring from another school, but most people take six years. Um, and at the beginning, people were like, what kind of rabbi do you want to be? And I said, well, I think I want to be a pulpit rabbi, a congregational rabbi, but a lot can change in six years, so we'll see. Six years later, People ask me, what kind of rabbi do you want to be? And I was still saying, I think I want to be a pulpit rabbi. Not much has changed in six years, so that's probably what I'm going to do. I was about three years out of college when I started rabbinical school. 
um, which means I was about three, two, three years older than college students. And I was like, people had told me, maybe consider being a Hillel rabbi. I think you'd be good at it. And I'm like, I'm not that much older than these students. What do I really have to offer them in terms of life experience? I, you know, I, I feel like we're too close in age for me to be that kind of a mentor to them or to be respected in that kind of a way by them. So it wasn't something that I was considering because I didn't really feel like it was right. I, I wasn't right for that kind of a job at my age. But six years later, when I'm graduating rabbinical school, I've actually worked with college age students in various communities through congregations and, and other types of programming. And while I hadn't really thought to myself, like, oh, I'm, I'm six years older than I was when I started this, and I'm not too close in age. Also, I'm not afraid of that age group anymore. But I hadn't really thought about it as an option because I was just saying the same thing I'd always said. But when the pandemic hit, and all of my job options shriveled up in March 2020, I had to expand what I was looking for. I had to look at more than just congregational positions because there weren't that many. And I went back to the Hillel idea and I was like, you know what? I'm older now. I'm not afraid of this age group anymore. I feel qualified. And it actually sounds like it could be really fun. <laughs> and since my predecessor uh, and I were friends, I was I heard he was leaving and I, I was like, oh, I can't follow you. He's like, you can follow me. You've got skills I don't have. I think you'd be a great fit for the school. You should go for it. So I went for it. And I'm here now. <laughs> and what sort of things are different with being a congregational rabbi and working with Hello? I would say the main thing difference is the obvious fact that all of my congregants, all the community members are approximately ages 18 to 22. Um, in most congregations, there might be a good, a good chunk of people who are in that age group. Um, but chances are, if there are folks in that, that age range, they aren't there all year because they're off at college for most of the year. Um, you sometimes see college students visiting for like holidays at their, at local synagogues in their college town. Um, but they often are just there for holidays. If they can't get home, they're not necessarily community members. Um, so you mostly see like adults of, you know, any age really and younger kids like high school and younger. Um, but uh, the second big difference is every four years, you have an entirely new community from the one you had four years ago. So, I mean, you, you are, you're basically serving a transient community. And there, in Hillel, there's no such thing as, well, we've always done it this way. <laughs> always is maximum four years old. <laughs> um, which is pretty cool because there's... I mean, in a congregation, we've always done it this way, can be very powerful. And I think it's really important to listen to the community when they say, this is a long lasting tradition. You know, we always use this tune for this prayer, or we always um, do, we always read the names of the of folks that we want to send healing to between these two verses and not before or after. Or, Whatever, whatever the tradition is, it, the fact that it's been around so long gives them kind of an anchor, a feeling of familiarity, which can be extremely powerful. The flip side of that is it makes it much harder to try something new in place of that beloved tradition. It's totally different in Hillel because nothing is older than four years for any of the community members, any of the students who are coming through. So you have opportunity to try on a lot of different things. And the flip side of that is if, if it works out, you, you, it doesn't like your success can only be at least four years long for any one student. 
Um, and so like, if it works for one group of students, you might get them to come back next year, but once they graduate, they won't be back. And so you're starting over fresh. And so it's definitely, um, uh, a faster cycle of re-engaging. You're always re-engaging. You don't, you don't grab somebody and then you've got them for 50 years and then they write your hello into their will. <laughs> um, so I think those are the main differences. And when did you decide that you wanted to become a rabbi? That's a fun question. <laughs> I would come home during rabbinical school and people would say, oh, what are you doing these days? And I'd say, I'm studying to be a rabbi. And they're like, oh, I always knew that's what you wanted to do. And I'm like, really? You could have told me because I didn't. <laughs> I, fresh out of college, I applied to not rabbinical school, but cantorial school, which is a school, a, 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 a training for the other kind of Jewish clergy, cantors. Um, and cantors are trained in Jewish sacred music. Um, there are lots of different systems of chanting, um, holy texts, lots of different uh, modes of chanting daily, weekly, monthly, holiday prayers. Um, and uh, it's an entirely different skill set. There's some overlap, obviously, but um, a lot of people think that if you are a rabbi and you can sing, then you can be both the rabbi and the cantor. And that's not true. Cantors are fully fledged clergy with a different skill set. Um, and that was originally what I wanted to do. That's what I wanted to be. My th three of my big passions in life are music, Judaism, and people. Being a cantor seemed to nicely encompass those three things. I was like, all right, that's, that's clearly the job for me. Off I go to apply to cantorial school. I, I applied. The response was, we like you. We see a lot of potential. We want you to work on some things and apply again in the future. In the process of working on said things, I realized, well, I shouldn't say I realized it wasn't quite so easy. My dad was the one who suggested that I think about being a rabbi. He's like, I, I think you'd make a good rabbi. You should think about doing that. And I was like, no, I know what I'm doing. I don't want to have to make any decisions. This is like, this is my path. <laughs> don't distract me. But I was hanging out with a lot of rabbis and working uh, in a Hebrew pro program with incoming rabbinical students. And um, the more I thought about it, the more excited I got about it. And I finally just was like, why not rabbi? And it was that, mo that moment was like a puzzle piece fitting into place. Like, yeah, yeah, that's what I want to do. I want to do that. I want to be that clergy. <laughs> So I made the switch, capital S, and three years after applying to cantorial school, I applied to rabbinical school and got in. And what was it like, uh, like during your childhood, being a member of the Jewish community? I grew up in the Reform Jewish movement. There are several uh, movements, branches, sects, how you can call them any any number of words of Judaism. Um, some of the, the main ones are Reform Judaism, Conservative, Orthodox, which Orthodox has its own like subset of um, different types of Orthodoxy. There's Reconstructing Judaism, there's Renewal, uh, and they're all really different and amazing. I grew up Reform. Uh, reform Jews... Uh, are often said to be the secular movement. Uh, that I mean, there's some truth to that. There, there are a lot of Reform Jews that do consider themselves secular um, and prefer secular over religious to describe themselves. Uh, but I was a religious Reform Jew. <laughs> the motto of the Reform movement is choice through knowledge. And I was like, give me that knowledge. I want, I, I had aspirations to do Judaism like an Orthodox person, but because I learned about it and decided it was meaningful to me, not because God told me to. I did not ever at any point in my life do 
all of the same things that an Orthodox Jew would have done, but I started keeping kosher, um, which my family didn't do. Uh, I started keeping Shabbat in some kinds of ways. None, none of what I was doing was the same as if you were to ask an Orthodox Jew or uh, a conservative Jew or, or any other uh, movement, somebody from any other movement, what I was doing was not going to look like and it, what most people were doing. But I was finding ways to make Jewish practice meaningful to me and make them work for me. And that's really what the reform movement was all about, was making Judaism accessible and applicable for people who didn't want to do it in the same ways as other movements. I went to Hebrew College, which is not affiliated with a movement. It's a non-denominational, pluralistic institution. I identify now as non-denominational and pluralistic, but that that value of meaning making from my reform upbringing really plays a big role in the way that I do Judaism myself and in the way that I try to guide people who come to me for um, guidance in making practices come to life for them. You know, it seems, I don't know, I, I think it can be kind of confusing, possibly, for someone to say, oh, I'm non-denominational and a rabbi. Yeah. So, so when people start to question that, how, how do you handle that? I don't really, I, I haven't really had anybody question, am I really a rabbi if I don't have a denomination? I think a lot of people who are orthodox will just group anyone who's not orthodox in the same blob and just label it reform and be like, oh, those reform Jews, they're not real Jews. That not, I just want to be clear, not everybody who's orthodox or, or any, nothing is a monolith. I still have had a lot of experiences <laughs> where people who call themselves orthodox will say that I am not Jewish because I am quote reform or I'm a woman who thinks that I'm a rabbi, but that's not, that's not a thing. So I'm not real. Um, and I think that's really unfortunate. I think that those voices, unfortunately, tend to be a lot louder than progressive Orthodox voices. Um, I, I do know that there are progressive Orthodox Jews out there who know that I'm a rabbi, respect that I'm a rabbi, and respect that my Judaism, my practice looks different from theirs, and that it is still valid. Um, unfortunately, that's, you'll find people who will invalidate anything different from what they know anywhere. In, in any religion and in any topic, really. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I tend to get it a lot more on TikTok than anywhere else. <laughs> it's TikTok. Like, you can't, you can't yeah. really uh, trust much. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so it's TikTok where, of course, I found you and um, where in your bio it says um, that you're a radically inclusive rabbi. So... What do you mean when you say that? Mm. Great question. And of course, the bio only allows me to have like, what, 50 characters? Right. <laughs> when I say radically inclusive, I mean that we, we like to describe Judaism in terms of a tent. I, I operate under big tent Judaism. There is room in this tent for you. There is room in this tent for you if you are atheist. There's room in this tent if you are queer. There is room in this tent for you if you are poly. I will not turn somebody away from Judaism for anything that's like, if you come to me and you say, I want to be Jewish, but I'm not ready to give up Jesus Christ, my savior, I'm afraid there's not, there's not really going to be room for that. <laughs> but... <laughs> Pretty much anything else. <laughs> yeah. So have you been able to help people kind of understand that, like, mindset that Judaism can be inclusive? Yes. Uh, my experience on TikTok 
uh, with that has been a lot of people commenting on my videos or sending me messages to say that because of my videos saying that Jews can be atheists um, and Jews can be queer, that they have felt validated. They have felt like they are seen in a way that no rabbi in their life has seen them before, in a way that they have felt alienated from their Jewish communities where they grew up. And they come to my TikTok congregation and feel like they belong. That's really great. It's a little harder. It's a little harder to explain to people who don't agree with that. Um, if if they're not going to agree with it, I'm not going to be able to change their mind if they're you know if they're uh, staunch in that mm-hmm. mindset. But people who are who tend to be progressive minded and um, and and open to um, big tent thinking. Mm-hmm they understand it pretty quickly. That's great. And the introduction, um, you know, I referred to you as a a demi woman, which is something that you've talked about on TikTok. And when we were exchanging emails, you also said that that you don't really use the term non-binary. And I'm sure that many people don't necessarily know what demi woman means. The first time I ever heard the term was on your TikTok. Um, So can you talk a little bit about definitions, your story and journey to figuring all of that out? Sure. Demi woman or demi lady or demi girl. I think most of the time I hear it as demi girl, but for reasons I can explain in a moment, girl does not work for me. Um, Demi woman means somebody assigned any gender at birth who identifies as woman some of the time, but not all of the time. Um, and there are, there's also Demi boy, Demi man for people who are assigned any gender at birth, but identify as a man some, but not all of the time. I came to this. Uh, well, I discovered it on a on a beautifully long list of genders that I had seen on a blog post a few years ago. Unfortunately, that page seems to have disappeared. I've looked for it, but I remember I was uh, reading through it with some friends, and we were like, "Wow, look at all these different genders! These are amazing." <laughs> the the words people come up with, like that, use really cool pronoun like or prefixes, um, and uh, and It really like any way that you could imagine your gender (laughs) was in this list. And um, at the time I was, I was like, cis woman here. Um, And uh, so in this past year, I was doing an exercise that I found for cis people to engage with their gender more deeply because cis people tend not to engage with their gender or think about it as deeply as people who are not cis. And so I was like, well, I want to do this exercise. I want to engage with my gender. Like gender is a construct and it's all made up. So like, I want to see what these questions are all about. And the questions were like, what makes you a woman? Um, And I was like, well, it's not my body. It's not the way I present. It's not my clothes. I I, I could I literally could not think of what made me a woman. Um, and I also didn't really feel any dysphoria around women. i I've been uh, socialized as a girl from childhood, and I've always had people use she her pronouns for me, and that felt familiar, and it didn't feel bad. And so I was like, well, what do I do with this? (laughs) I, after thinking about it some more, I realized that what I really identified with was the experience of people who were assigned female at birth um, and I, and continue to identify as women. Um, I associated with womanhood. I, I associated, I, I resonated with um, struggles for gender equality. I resonated with um, the 
the challenges of the patriarchy and sexism as they relate to women. Like all of that is a huge part of who I am and how I function in the world and how I talk to the people in the world around me. And I, I don't think that makes me a woman, but it feels so much a part of me that it's it i i don't really know how to articulate that without associating myself with womanness um on the and and at the same time i don't always feel like gender is real <laughs> so while i when i when i first did this i was like i don't feel like non-binary is not the word i want to use i i feel like non-binary is like there's a, a space for non-binary people and I, I don't want to enter that space. I don't feel like it's for me, at least not right now in my life. Um, also, there are a lot of, you know, assumptions that come with different labels. Demi woman is a label that not a lot of people know. I think it's gaining some, uh, some more acknowledgement as more people are using it. I've seen it a lot more in the past year than I have at any other point um, since I learned the word. Um, but like, I will say, I will, I kind of casually be like, some days I feel more woman and sometimes I feel more non-binary, like, but I'm not actively using non-binary as a term for myself. And what has the reaction been to that journey from people who are close with you? I was pleasantly surprised that, um, when I came out to my parents, immediately before posting it on Facebook, um, that it led to like an hour long conversation about gender with them. And like, we talked about all of our genders together. Like I was, when I came out as bisexual to my mom, I w we were like sitting on the couch. I was on OkCupid. I showed her my phone and I was like, really bothers me when people post like four identical pictures of themselves with like slightly different angles. And I showed it to her and she was like, Oh, are you dating girls now? I was like, yeah, I'll, I'll date anybody. And she was like, Oh, okay. And that was my, that was my coming out as bisexual to my mom story. Like, <laughs> I mean, I, I am well aware how privileged I am to have family that is supportive and not like I wasn't kicked out you know I and my heart goes out to people who live closeted or or risk that and sometimes in, in indeed lose that family connection so I I know that the story is kind of silly but also I I, I understand how lucky I am um, so I was kind of expecting that the demi woman announcement would go similarly that my parents would be like all right just uh, another thing that Sarah's doing with the the queer thing <laughs> like whatever <laughs> why do you feel you need to tell us um and instead it was really cool like we sat in the room and my dad was like what was this exercise you did i started reading the questions and my mom was like well i i tried doing this exercise when i when you told me originally that you did it and i was answering the questions and i was like i don't know how to answer this i just know i'm a woman and i was like exactly i didn't have that answer that's why it's different <laughs> and my dad was like trying to answer the questions and like didn't really know how to answer probably similar to my mom because like there's so many associations with things like body and pre like gender presentation that like he's like i'm a guy therefore i do this thing and it was well <laughs> you don't have to be a guy to do that thing and uh, so it was really interesting. Um, and, uh, I was very surprised and very glad to have that experience <laughs> that evening. Um, most other people like who responded on Facebook were like, you know, welcome out again. And I'm so proud of you. One person was even like, I wondered when this was going to happen. <laughs> I was like, did you really have, you know, a suspicion about me? <laughs> They're like, yeah, I just kind of got the feeling. 
probably like the rabbi thing. People know me better than I know myself sometimes. Right. I just need to catch up. Exactly. That, that, that's probably how it is with a lot of people. Now, do you remember like what this exercise was called? Um, it, it was like a series of tweets that someone had posted screenshots of on Facebook. <laughs> I could, I could dig it up for you if you want to like put a link. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, if it's possible, that, that would be cool. If you can't find it, that's okay. I'll try to find okay, it. Cool. Um, so, so being a jammy woman, being bisexual, what over time has your dating life been like? If you're willing to talk about that, as I'm asking this question, I'm like, <laughs> wow, that's really personal. <laughs> Um, so when I came out as bi, um, I had exclusively dated cis men. Not all of them were straight, but they were all cis men. At least at the time that I knew them, it's possible that some of them I don't know anymore have come out, but somehow I doubt that. Um, and I was like, you know what? I, I am, I have realized that I am interested in any gender i will date anybody it's 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 uh been too many cis men for me so i am only going to date um uh women or uh, like not just women but like non-binary people or trans men i just no more cis het men i was like done with this for now so for a while i was um going on dates exclusively with Non men, non cis, non cis men, um, and uh, most of them were uh, women. And um, funnily enough, I got a message from a cis het man. <laughs> I well, I was about to give up on OK Cupid. I went through these cycles where I would just like give up on it and like not touch it for months. And I was about to do that, and I got a message, and I was like he's cute. He's Jewish. Um, and I could tell from his picture that he had by wife energy. <laughs> I don't know if you've seen that TikTok sound making the rounds, but mm -hmm. for any listeners who don't know what that means, by wife energy is basically, uh, somebody who, a, a guy who gives women or non-men, uh, like a safe feeling around him that like he's going to be supportive. He's going to be emotionally available. He's going to like emote in healthy ways that he's uh, not toxic masculine. Um, toxic masculinity and bi wife energy are like opposites. Mm -hmm. So, you know, sometimes you can just tell from somebody's picture that they're going to have bi wife energy. And so I was like, all right, I'll, I'll go on a date with him. And we hit it off and then we went on another date and we went on another date and I was living with my parents at the time because it was pandemic. And I said, mom, dad, I know that we're like, you know, masking and keeping our distance. I'd really like to hold his hand on the next date. <laughs> and I was, and they were like, all right, but you got to wash your hands before you come back home. <laughs> and, um, we are still together. <laughs> so after discovering I'm bi and swearing off of cis het men, I am now partnered with a cis het man. <laughs> As it sometimes happens. Mm -hmm. Oh gosh. And um, what has it been like dating through the pandemic? And now, you know, you have a new job, you had to move. What has all of that been like? Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, the pandemic, um, at, like in the beginning when we were dating, it was, it kind of forced us to really get to know each other emotionally. Um, like it was, it was a slow roll to start. And I usually take things slow anyway. Um, but like, it just felt heightened because of the pandemic and, you know, we're, we were masked around each other for months and, we would go on socially distanced picnics and walks and um, stargazing and uh, like all we could do was talk or 
specifically not talk if we were, you know, in silence together. And it was great. It was when we were like, all right, I feel like we could have our first kiss now. That was when it got hard (laughs) because there was still a pandemic happening. (laughs) Um, We ended up getting COVID tests and uh, we got to have our first kiss. And then, and then after that date, we went back to masking for a while. Um, So, you know, it was definitely interesting being a COVID couple. Um, Eventually, uh, you know, we, the, he had some roommates and I had my family were my roommates and we all were like, you know, everybody is being safe. Um, Everybody is wearing masks. The people that weren't working from home were um, working in jobs where they didn't like come into a lot of contact with people. So like we ended up eventually not having masks uh, anymore. Um, And that's been really nice, especially once we got vaccinated and all our families got vaccinated and we could actually, you know, have our parents have met. (laughs) Um, But now I moved out to Syracuse and he's still in Boston and uh, it's going to be hard, but we're going to make it through it. Mm -hmm. Well, I love to hear how responsible you are being. I think that is a a point um, to to congratulate. Uh, We always love responsibility, especially with this pandemic. Now Mm -hmm. I have general knowledge of where Syracuse and Boston are. Uh, (laughs) How far is like a drive? It's probably about five hours um, door to door for us right now. Okay. That's doable. That is totally doable. Yes. So. Yeah. It's not going to be every weekend, but you know, I, I'm, my dad's birthday is at the beginning of August. So I'm going to be going back my si- and my sister's coming from the West coast for that. So like, I'll go, my parents can have all three of their kids. And, um, so we'll be able to see each other then. Great. I'm going to, I'm going to open it up to you. What else would you like to talk about, about your story? A fun fact about me is that I'm also a Zumba instructor. And how did that come about? Because like, I don't know, (laughs) Zumba instructor and rabbi uh, don't seem like they fit in the same sentence. (laughs) (laughs) Well, when I was in college, my mom started taking Zumba classes at the dance studio where my sister took lessons. And home on breaks, my mom was like, you want to come to Zumba with me? I was like, what's that? She said, it's dance exercise. I said, you know, I can't dance. She said, you know, I can't either. And I was like, that's a good point. What time is it? Nine o'clock. Fine. I'll wake up for nine o'clock. After that class, I was like, I will wake up at nine every day. (laughs) It was so much fun. Uh, That was in like 2008 ish. And um, eventually my, one of my Zumba instructors was like, you know, you've gotten pretty good at this. You should consider getting your license to teach and get paid to do Zumba. Um, I've always had good rhythm. I've been musical my whole life, but I've not always had good body coordination. Um, and sometimes like seeing the instructor with arms, legs, and hips all going in different directions, I was like, well, I don't even know what's going on here. <laughs> and after several years of doing it and just having fun, your body learns how to move in different ways. And now I'm the one with arms, legs, and hips all going in different directions. And people are like, I don't know how they're doing that. And, um, and then I'm just like, pick one You just do arms today or just do legs today. Add something else next week. Um, I've also like practiced moves in the supermarket (laughs) or in the car. Um, and so I did, I, in 2012, I think it was or 2011 I got my license to teach and um it's it's been so much fun it's a different workout when you're the instructor um but I think I get a really good workout when I'm the instructor because uh I work harder so that my participants will work harder um and especially you know I mean, group exercise is really motivating for me. So in the pandemic, it's been hard doing it on Zoom. 
um, when I'm a participant and nobody can see me, <laughs> it's, you know, it could be easy to just slack a little bit, but when I'm the instructor, you can't, I can't slack. People are literally, everybody's watching me and nothing else. Cause I, I'm the one on their screen. Um, so that's been really good for me. Um, but the, it's funny, the rabbi and Zoom instructor thing, when I first applied to rabbinical school, this was not the school I went to, but a different school asked me in, in the interview, where do you see the intersection between Zumba and the rabbinate? And I was like, oh, well, my friends like to joke and say that I'll be the Zumba instructor rabbi offering alternative Saturday morning services. Nobody laughed. <laughs> But the best part of this of this story is that several years later, I was asked to lead a Zumba class as part of one of the offerings for a Saturday morning service. So we started together praying, then we went off into different activities. I led a Zumba class where like the the focusing on those different muscle groups was like connected spiritually. So this one's working our chest muscles. This is about our heart. This one's working our leg muscles. And so it's about grounding ourselves. This one's about working our arms and it's about outreach to the community. Like it was great. And then we all came back together for the Torah service. Um, so I, in fact, have been the Zumba instructor rabbi who offered alternative <laughs> Saturday morning services. But I, I mean, now that I was asked that question, I see the parallels everywhere. It's like, it's amazing how similar it is to be a rabbi and to be a Zumba instructor. When I'm teaching a workout, it's not my workout. It's the participants' workout. When I'm leading services, this is not my prayer experience. This is their prayer experience. I'm, it's not about what I'm getting out of it. It's how I'm serving them. If I get something out, if I get a workout, if I get a good prayer experience, like at the same time, good for me, but that's not the goal. You can be like... You can be self-absorbed when you're teaching Zumba. You can be like looking at yourself in the mirror and being like, look how good I am. Look at my moves. And when you're leading services or being a rabbi, you can be really self-absorbed and like, I look so pious right now. Look how deeply I'm bowing. Look how cool my, my prayer shawl looks. And like not paying attention to whether the other people are having a safe and healthy experience. <laughs> like you can, <laughs> there are so many parallels and I talked about it so much more than I ever would have expected in school, in rabbinical school, when we were having conversations about what it means to be a rabbi for the people. And I, I was able to bring up Zumba everywhere. I'm sure my classmates got sick of it. <laughs> <laughs> and so, a couple things, but going back to like when you first were learning Zumba and then like made the switch to being a teacher, I'm just curious because I've, I've done group classes how mm -hmm. difficult was it to learn how to speak while doing the Zumba moves? Well, I think, I think that there are two pieces to that. One is, can you activate your vocal cords while you're working out? Um, like it takes breath. So, um, Breathing while you're like engaging your core muscles and your abs can be very difficult, like takes practice. Um, but in that way, I was prepared because uh, most of my Zoom instructors would like have us whoop and holler, you know, just to keep us engaged, also to let them know that we were breathing. <laughs> <laughs> so I could activate my vocal cords. <laughs> I could make noises while I was working out. But the other piece is, can you say coherent things? <laughs> um, and I think that I was able to catch on to that pretty easily. I know that that's uh, not necessarily true for everybody. Um, but like, there, there were definitely some more nuanced skills that I did not catch on to right away, like knowing when to say the, the cue. You don't want to say the cue at the same moment as the first beat of the thing that's coming up. So I don't want to, I don't want to be like, I, I don't want to say left on the moment that you're supposed to step to the left. You want to do it about two beats earlier so that people have a heads up and they know you're about to go left and they can prepare their body weight and shift it appropriately to free up their left foot. Um, so that definitely took practice. 
Um, also, you know, using your arms, like in, you can, you can point or you can like, you know, if you want people to spin in a circle, you do draw a circle in the air with your finger, um, all these different things that you can do. Um, some of them can actually be worked into the choreography. So, um, you know, like hand, if your hands are going up, up, and then, and then waist, waist, and like the next set of moves, you know, from the last time you did this move that your hands were on your waist, like people have cued themselves, their hands are on their waist, they know exactly what's coming, you don't even have to cue them <laughs> with your voice or anything else. So like there, there's some cool ways to cue that I did not do right away. Um, but that I learned later. And Zumba is, is it, they like to say, you know, don't verbally cue because this is a dance party and you don't cue people verbally at a dance party. <laughs> you want to be able to feel like they're at a dance party, not that they're in a workout. Um, but I think that there's a lot of value to cueing in many different ways. And are you hoping to continue to teach Zumba while at Syracuse? Definitely. Uh, I taught this morning <laughs> on Zoom. On Zoom, I had uh, three participants, three of my regulars. Um, I had been teaching three classes a week in the mornings uh, prior to moving. Uh, now that I have a full time schedule, the weekdays aren't working right now, so I'm just teaching on the weekends. But um, I would love to um, figure out how to get more classes during the week. Uh, I'm not comfortable yet going into gyms. I think we're not out of the woods yet with this pandemic. I think a lot of people think it's over or they're like, I'm vaccinated. Therefore, you know, I, I I'm carefree now and I don't have to wear masks anywhere. I don't have to worry. We've got a, a new variant that's very contagious. Also being vaccinated doesn't mean that you'll not get the uh the coronavirus it just means that if you get it you may not end up in the hospital and you're less likely to get it or pass it but it's still possible so i'm being i'm still being very cautious i know a lot of people think i'm being too cautious but i know somebody who was vaccinated who did get covid so like it's still happening so i'm not going to be teaching in person for a while um, going to stay on zoom for the time being, but I would love to get back into an actual studio, a, a dance studio or a gym and like be with the people and make the room smell sweaty together again. <laughs> oh gosh. Um, yes, hopefully soon. Um, we can feel a little bit safer out there to be able to get sweaty together. <laughs> <laughs> um, now, I know that nobody else can see you, but since we are on a video call, I'm curious to know what the entire saying on your shirt is, because I can only see the beginning of oh. it. <laughs> it says feminism is for everybody. <laughs> that is that is great. Now, do you um, do you have a lot of shirts pronouncing equality and great messages like that one? Oh, yes. I have. I used to wear like exclusively um, like tight fitting clothing. Uh, that was also when I had, you know, my body has changed a little since like high school and college, which is great. I have the body of a goddess. I love it. Uh, and I'm not as comfortable in such form fitting clothing as I used to be. Uh, sometimes it's fine, but I have really discovered my love for t-shirts. I have to cut the neck out of all of them because I have neck sensitivities, um, like sensory issues with things on my neck. Um, so my t-shirts are unfortunately, I even with a the blazer, they're too casual to wear to work. But I love my t-shirts and I have one that says, e let equality bloom. I have one that says, be a nice human. I have one that says respect. And then it has a picture of the earth. Like I have some great t-shirts that are, that have good messages yeah. and I'm excited to only wear them on weekends or after work. <laughs> yes, of course. Now, one final question before we start to wrap things up. Why did you decide to get on TikTok? Well, 
The shallow answer, uh, which is true, <laughs> is I was curious. Um, I, I'm not, I haven't really followed a lot of the social media trends. Like I, I started with MySpace and then I moved to Facebook and then I never really left. I got Snapchat when I heard my mom was getting snaps from my brother and sister. And I was like, I want their snaps. I want to know what they're up to. And they stopped using Snapchat because my brother stopped using social media altogether. And my sister moved on to Instagram. And I was like, I, I'm too tired for this. I'm not, I'm not getting Instagram. I had an Instagram, but like, I, I still have never posted on it. A lot of people follow me, but I don't know what they're following. Um, and uh, TikTok, of course, was, you know, one of the latest social media platforms. And then there, then it was in the news. And I was like, well, it's, you know, it's potentially problematic. But is it really any more problematic than Facebook? Is our, Facebook's already stealing everything, all of our information. Like, but why should I bother? Um, and I guess I think it was like in May or June. Um, I decided I wanted to, you know, just explore it a little bit. So I I made it. I I was also like thinking about how as as a rabbi, Facebook is not going to be the best way to be in touch with the people, all the people. Um a lot of rabbis use Instagram to uh to engage with their community members and so I was like, well, all right, so I'll I'll see what TikTok is all about. And I started having fun with it. <laughs> and I realized like in the year of the pandemonium, I hadn't really had much of an outlet for like reaching people and and doing like Jewish education stuff. I've been teaching Hebrew school, which was great. I had a lot of fun. Um but it was for a specific age group of sixth grade at, or, and I wanted to do some, some more stuff that like maybe would be more appropriate for a broader range of ages. Um, and talk about things that I was interested in and not just the stuff that I wanted to make sure that they learned from the year. Um, and so it became this really cool outlet for Jewish educational stuff. Um, I found a great group of people that use the hashtag progressive clergy, and we have a support group for ourselves on Facebook where we, you know, ask each other questions and be like, how would you respond to this? Or check out my new video. And, you know, I was able to say to them, I just started a bad religious pickup line series. You should all check it out because if you're not watching it, you're missing out on some really fun content. <laughs> And, you know, they all went over to like my stuff and like, it's really great to have this group of people. And it means that when folks who are not Jewish fall into progressive Jewish TikTok and they're like, I don't know how I ended up in progressive Jewish TikTok, but it seems nice here. I'll be like, check out hashtag progressive clergy for a lot more people like me in many other denominations of different faiths. And people have been able to connect with some of these other clergy folks and it's been great all around that's really great so with all of my guests i ask a random question at the end that has nothing to do with anything we've talked about um <laughs> so we'll see if you have an answer for this my question i have today is what is your favorite condiment when you said favorite I immediately panicked because I don't really do favorites. I do more like top tens, top fives. But then you said condiment and it's so easy. It's ketchup. <laughs> when I was little, my parents called me the ketchup queen. I put it on everything. I used it on tuna instead of mayo. I ate, I, I dipped my asparagus in it. Like ketchup on everything. I ate ketchup and mustard sandwiches. Just ketchup on one slice, mustard on the other, put them together, eat it. Like I didn't do PB and J. I did ketchup and mustard. <laughs> so my favorite condiment has always been and probably always will be ketchup. Do you still put ketchup on basically everything? Mm, not everything. I will have mayo on my tuna these days. And I have also discovered that there are other condiments that are quite delicious. 
<laughs> but ketchup will always have a special place in my heart. All right, that brings this episode to a close. I will obviously be leaving Rabbi Noyo's TikTok in the description. So if you want to go check out that series that I mentioned or really just any other good content that she shares, that would be awesome to go check out. And if we did indeed find the Twitter thread about the questions that they use to talk about gender, we'll be leaving a link to that as well if we can find it. And of course, if you would like to connect with the podcast, we are, our website is in the description. It brings us to all of the social media, including Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn. And if you'd like to be a guest on the podcast, feel free to send me an email. I love to have different guests. And I was really excited to have my first guest to talk about um, religion and just dive into that. So it's been a really great conversation today. And of course, you can find this podcast, of course, wherever you're listening, but it's also on YouTube with closed captions. So I really like being able to give that option to people. So thank you so much, Rabbi Noyo, for spending time with me today and to my listeners for taking the time out of your day to hear a new story. Until next time. Bye. Thank you so much. Bye.